From the openly unfinished scores of Luigi Nono to the impossible exactness deceptively required by the complex scores of Brian Furniel, from the accusations against the unprepared dissonances in Monteverdi's Seconda Pratica to the casual high harmonics that emerge from Pablo Casal's bow in his recordings of Bach's cello suites, the world of music is rich with imperfections. But the question of what is musical imperfection remains an elusive one. As a morphologically negative word, the meaning of imperfection shifts according to different connotations of perfection. As a determinate concept, perfection has lost the centrality it once held in philosophy, especially in 18th century discourse. But a word operates in many layers, not all of them dependent on conceptualization. In everyday music making, perfectionist reminiscences continue to operate and musical imperfections to emerge and act. Therefore, the task of advancing comprehension of imperfection in music is a task especially suited to artistic research, for it is in artistic practice that these senses are best pursued, discerned, and elucidated. In this concert lecture, I explore two selected senses of musical imperfection in a new research composition for flute. The second half of the presentation is a video of the private premiere of the full cycle, performed by Eric Lapp, enriched with selected fragments of the scores and a few written remarks of my own. These highlight in real time manners in which these senses of musical imperfection operate in the music. This is a video version of a concert lecture first presented last October, during the second year presentation of my doctoral investigation at the Articulationen Festival for Artistic Research. The composition was also premiered at that occasion. In this lecture, I place particular attention on elucidating the connections between artistic practice and critical reflection, and demonstrating how these connections advance comprehension of imperfection in music, bearing consequence in performance practice. The senses of imperfection I explore emerge in my creative practice. The effort to clarify and develop conceptually on these senses pertains to the nature of language, but it must not lead to the false impression of a primacy of concepts to be later applied, tested, demonstrated. My methodology reflects the centrality of artistic practice. The data for my lecture comes entirely from the documentation of the process, my own scores, manuscripts and notes, as well as the video recorded working sessions. I will refer to no external bibliography. Yet, scholarly research in which I engaged previously still acts in the background, especially two investigations, a mapping of the word imperfection, according to etymology, synonyms, antonyms, thesauri, and dictionarized senses, and examination of the rise and fall of the concept of aesthetic perfection in Baumgarten, Hume, and Kant. A quick assessment of some key theoretical aspect from these previous investigations will allow us to proceed quicker, providing clearer ground for considering the actual music. We start with the word. Imperfection is, by its very morphology, a relational term. It does not have meaning in itself, but acquires its meaning in opposition to perfection. As a first consequence, in order to have any meaning at all, imperfection needs some perfection to oppose. Attempts to embrace or dismiss imperfection by abandoning any notion of perfection are just two ways to evade the discussion, frequently ignoring the roles this notion actually plays in musical praxis. I am not saying that perfection has a univocal and fixed meaning, but that it has many shifting comprehensions. As a second consequence, the meaning of imperfection must shift accordingly. Consider the image of a mobidi as a metaphorical model. We can identify and discuss fixed axes, but the meanings are constantly shifting, maintaining some opposing configurations while evading others. Thus, no comprehension of imperfection can claim to be absolute or stable. Something can only be imperfect in relation to a specific perfection. It might simultaneously be perfect in relation to other senses of perfection. Therefore, 
to criticize a specific sense or instance of musical imperfection by arguing that, looking from another angle it could even be a perfection, is an empty critique that fails to recognize the mobile relationality of the term. Hence, to discuss musical imperfections, it will always be necessary to clarify in what sense this is an imperfection, in relation to which perfection, and address the discussion in terms of this provisorily fixed axis. It does not follow that any comprehension of the diet is possible or equally relevant. My mapping of imperfection shows stronger and weaker senses. Another important indication is protagonism of the term perfection in philosophy, which we find in the 18th century. But the main field to identify some of the stronger notions of musical imperfection is performance practice. My documentation backs the argument that many perfectionist notions that appear in practice are strongly related to the perfectionist concepts of 18th century aesthetics, hence their relevance to my research. Amongst the stronger senses of the imperfection-perfection diet figure incompleteness, expectations, and pattern. I have started to explore these and many others in this composition. For this lecture, I will focus on only two, the notions of intentionality and exactness. For the sake of time and clarity, I will frequently refer to the positive term of the diet, using words that relate to perfection, but always implying the meaning of an opposing imperfection. Terms are employed in their common dictionarized sense as a starting point for each argument developed within the limits of this text. Thus, words that feature strongly in specific established discourses do not imply adopting specific implications unless otherwise stated. One of the etudes you will hear today focuses on whistle tones, exploring the inherent instability of this technique. While some whistle tones may be played in a very pure and controlled manner, most tend to fail or break. Both notations of the study tell the performer how to produce the whistle tones by defining the fundamental notes and what resulting pitch to look for. Yet, the score does not faithfully represent the actual output concerning each individual resulting note, as this changes every time due to the inherent instability of the technique. The score tells the performer what to try to do and how, but what emerges is something else. Eric asked me whether he should prioritize the resulting pitches or the prescribed fundamentals, for he could, using other fingerings, increase the stability of the resulting pitches. By sacrificing the lower staff, he could better control the upper staff. This reveals an aspect ubiquitous in my research, the implicit priority of pitch over other musical parameters. But changing the fingerings would change the harmonic series that defines which notes can appear more or less randomly, into which the prescribed pitches break. The fingerings define the subjacent harmony. Thus. These fingerings are not only a means to produce the whistle tones, but an important compositional layer, one that emerges in a fragmentary manner throughout the piece, but still organizes its architecture. Finally, the fragility and instability of the emerging pitches are an essential aspect of the piece, both in its general sound quality and as a principle underlying the compositional structure. After this conversation, Eric shifted his focus to the fingering layer, Yet this shift risks abandoning the upper layer, using the signed fingerings, but letting whistle tones emerge randomly. Though priority has shifted, it is still important to try to play the upper voice. For if he does not try, not even a few of the written fragments will emerge. And it is also vital compositionally that at least some of them appear, though how many and which is not key to the piece. The coda explores this principle attempting to maintain the same sustained pitch in whistle tones while changing between different fundamentals. This is a clear assignment of a theoretically possible task, but close to impossible in actual performance. What happens in performance is that the B-flat becomes a center of gravity. Not a stable note, but the note the performer always tries to come back to. 
at best the most frequent note. This prevalence would not emerge if the performer did not try to achieve the almost impossible task of holding a stable B-flat notated in the score. In this divorce between trying and succeeding, a strong sense of imperfection resides. Unintentionality. In this term, different layers coexist. The intentionality of the composer, the intentionality of the performer, and the trace of an intention as fixed on the score. We frequently assume that these are aligned, but in many cases they are not. The question of what the composer actually wanted is frequent. A performer may then interpret the score, claiming to align his intentions with those of the composer. From these two, the intention of the composer bears greater weight and authority. Yet, deviation from the intention of the performer is harder to justify. While the performer may intentionally deviate from the score, claiming that the intention of the composer requires this deviation, the performer intending to produce a certain sound and obtaining a different one has no justification. It can only be an error, a mistake. Despite all intentions, the score is the only fixed place in this system. While a score does not have intentionality, it fixes the trace of intentions in notation. A fixity that is simultaneously open to questioning and the explicit law to which a performance refers. The performer can explore elements that are present in the score regardless of them being or not the intention of the composer. They are there, and that might suffice. A different distinction exists between specific intentionality and general intentionality. These two might be at odds. In this attitude, while my general intention as a composer predicts that some notes fail, I cannot in the same sense say that it is my intention that one specific whistle tone fails. And while the flutist understands my general intention, he must still try to achieve specific intentions that oppose the general one. Each failed or wrong whistle tone will continue to be an imperfection in relation to the intentions of the performer, despite general comprehension. But in regard to general intentions, these specific imperfections do not constitute a general imperfection. When something different than what was attempted happens, it is an imperfection in relation to intention. A second fundamental sense of imperfection comes from the idea of exactness. A thing is exact if it coincides in all aspects with something else. This something else can be another thing, in which case we say that both things are identical. It can also be a model, a rule, or any sort of projection of what it should be. In this case, exactness meets intentionality. But exactness has the particularity of implying unicity as opposed to multiplicity. If two things which are different from each other are compared to a standard, only one of them can be exact. In opposition, the composer or performer may have the intention of not being exact. Intentionality accepts multiplicity in a way that exactness does not. To oppose exactness, one must go against the implied unicity. In doing this, once again we find the score playing a special and problematic role for the score is only one. The composer has many different ideas, but chooses one. She then considers many options of notation, but chooses one. This becomes one score, from which the performer will work. If the performer is unconvinced, he asks the composer, what exactly do you want here? If what is implied in the score is substantially different from the intention of the composer, both may come to the conclusion that this is not the best notation and needs to be changed. Even if the composer looks for a notation that does not imply exactness, the score is still only one. Multiple performances emerge from this one point, which remains the reference. The first year of my research had already made clear the need to enhance multiplicity by transforming the way the performer relates to the score. The current cycle has taken me one step further. This opening phrase of my multiphonic attitude shows two different ways of notating the same music. 
But the very rhythms I wrote in the menstrual notation were designed not to convey a feeling of pulse, to sound free. I also wrote molto liberamente in both. So the performer can modify the tempo. It is, therefore, a deception to believe that the menstrual notation is more precise than the graphic one. In giving both options to the performer, I undermine the unicity of the score. He can choose from which to play, combine both, or use either in different phases of the creation process. The music still has identity, but no possibility of exactness. This does not seem radical when multiplicity only concerns notation. But when multiple scores also question established hierarchies, such as the primacy of pitch, the paradigmatic shift becomes blatant. It was clear to me from the beginning that the main parameter of the study on different articulations was neither pitch nor rhythm. All three scores agree on the main factors that create the identity of this piece. It is not important if the figure in bar 3 is a tuplet of 11 in the space of 10 or 9 or of 8. It is also not important which exact pitches form the contour of the phrase. Why then include a thoroughly notated score? This works as a realization of a Baroque basso continuo, one possible performance solution, but which the performer knows can be modified without compromising the identity of the piece. In my case, this non-standard status only emerges because this notation appears in the company of two other options. None can claim unique primacy. <laughs> Employing multiple scores and notations is an imperfectionist approach in the sense that it undermines any possibility of exactness. Intentionality and exactness are strong perfectionist terms. In both, the score plays an important role. Exploration of multiple scoring offers new and substantially different possibilities in this regard. Earlier in my research, it had already become clear that imperfectionist creation required questioning the role of the score within the context of notated composition. But if the road forward does not imply abandoning the score, it does require fundamentally changing performance practice. It's not a question of composition, it's a question of performance practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is creating, I think what we're doing is creating, at least for me, from the futistic perspective, a different, a new performance practice. Even just through this as a vessel, you know, because we are exploring, we're, you know, it's sort of like looking at these kind of straightforward techniques, but from a different angle or through, you know, through a different lens. Yeah. And that sort of informs a new performance practice.